So I want to mention a word that that is was new for me, but you identified it and you've experienced, and that's called boomerang. It's a boomerang parent yeah. where the child has left and then has come back home. Talk about that because that's something maybe a lot of us didn't expect, but that's the season of this empty nest ish that we're all kind of <laughs> navigating right now. Well, hey guys, welcome back to the podcast. And this is the second to last episode of 2024. I can't believe it. And it's been amazing to have these conversations and to have you lean in for them wherever you're listening from. Thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Over the rest of this year, you can go listen to some episodes you missed, or you can binge listen, go back and listen to some, listen to re-listen to your favorites. I would love if you would also just take a second while you're listening and subscribe and leave a review. That really helps more listeners to find these encouraging conversations that help us to make our life matter for the kingdom. Well, before we sign off for 2024, there were a few women that I wanted to make sure that I brought here to the podcast. You heard from Judy Dunnigan last week, and today it's going to be such a needed conversation as we start back in the fall, and it's fall, and some of us are already, you know, full swing now back into school, whether your kids are in elementary, junior high, high school, but some are in college, and if you've walked through this season like I have in the last few years, it's called empty nest and some parents cry and others celebrate and you might be feeling all of the above and a lot of crazy emotions, good and bad, happy and sad. And listen, none of these emotions are wrong and it's normal. So let's just get that out of the way. And Edie Melson is here today to show us how to turn to God for help in her brand new book called Soul Care when the nest is empty. And I've known Edie for a couple of years, but this is my first time to get to sit down and really have an in-depth conversation with her. And it's gonna be so poignant, I can already tell, as we talk about navigating this season, Edie has walked through the empty nest season several times and in several ways, from sending a son off to war at 18, to sending another off on a round the world mountain climbing trek. And you know, as an adventure <laughs> junkie, I got to ask you about that, Edie. And with each situation, she has been quick to share how God is faithful in all ways and at all times. Her numerous books reflect her passion to help others call on God's strength during challenging times, often using creativity, which is one of her strengths. She's a photographer. She's a, a powerful leader of communicators, and she helps empower this connection. She also knows the necessity of soul care. She leads retreats, conferences, workshops around the world in ways to use creativity to help strengthen our connection with God. She and her husband, Kirk, have been married for 42 years. Congratulations. <laughs> they have three grown sons, three grandkids. They live in the foothold hills of the Blue Ridge Mountains, and they can often be found with their big black dog hiking the mountains. So Edie, I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> Welcome to the Make Life Matter podcast. I am so excited to be here. So this is this is amazing. Thank it's you. It's a treat. It's a treat for me. We know each other. We live in the same spaces. We we carry similar callings. Um, and but I'm just finding out today this is actually your fourth book in your soul care series. So talk about that and, and how this has really become a passion for yours because it's so, so, so needed, whether we're a Christian communicator or whoever we are, but I would love to hear your journey with this, Edie. Well, about nine years ago, my dad finished up his battle with Alzheimer's. Oh. And at the end of that, my sister and I were supporting my mother and we were all just trying to make it through. And we were exhausted. I had a book due and it was just, it was a really hard time. And I found mm -hmm. myself sitting in the parking lot, crying out to God. I told him I knew that I needed him more than ever, but I had no time and I was exhausted. I mean, I confess that my prayers at night often ended with me sleeping instead of amen. Yeah. And I felt like he impressed on my spirit that it wasn't up to me to make the relationship work and to access his strength. What I needed to do was to let go and to let him work in those small in-between moments because mm -hmm. he showed me that sometimes he calls us to busy seasons of life, but that doesn't mean that he's not going to strengthen us in the same amazing ways. 
And so I began giving him those 10 minutes here and those five minutes there. And of course, being creative, that's the way I did it. I carry a little sketchbook doodle pad, really. I don't I don't do art very well mm -hmm. in my purse. And I would just write out a word like faith and doodle around it. Or I would write out exhausted or can't go on. And it would become a prayer and it would become a doorway for wow. me to focus on God and to let him come in, calm my spirit, renew my strength and give me the ability to move on. Well, by the time my dad had won his battle in mm -hmm. heaven with Alzheimer's, I had people asking me what changed. Mm -hmm. You were exhausted. You were cranky. You were unable to cope. And in the last two months, everything changed. And mm -hmm. so I realized that what I had stumbled into was the rhythm of Sabbath rest mm -hmm. through creativity. And so that's when I began writing about it. I love that so much because I, I'm, I'm picturing just a young mom who's listening right now. I have a friend who says she she spends time with God in the nooks and crannies around raising four young kids. And so whatever season we're in, we have to be intentional. But I love the way you're describing, you know, releasing rather than striving toward that. Because when you're grieving, when you're going through a difficult time, the last thing we need is more pressure on our shoulders that we're not measuring up, that we're not doing it right. And as a creative, I, I've never done what you just shared, but I love um, not only is that visual and it's you're getting it out of you and onto paper so it doesn't have that power over you internally. But I imagine that, you know, gave way to even the books. What are your other soul care? This is soul care. Um, I don't want to say the title wrong for the empty nest. So yep. So when care the when the nest is empty. It's empty. What the, the first one, time? sorry, the first one was soul care when you're weary. And it okay. really addresses that caregiving or that new mom series season when you're yeah. just beyond exhausted. Mm -hmm. um, then I did one for creatives called soul care when you're writing. Okay. And then I did one called Soul Care When You're Grieving. And that book was actually a year late coming out because I had been writing the book all year long. It was due the week of November 23rd, 2020. Mm -hmm. And that was the week that we lost my daughter-in-law in a horrific farming accident, leaving my son with their three-year-old baby. And so I called my publisher and I said, I cannot <laughs> release a book on grief right now. And she said, of course you can't, but wait, it'll come. And so about a year and a half later, we released that book. But it was so cool because God had had me studying grief mm -hmm. for a whole year before we lost her. So, mm -hmm. you know, God's provision. And of course, I went back and made a few changes to the book and then this last book is Soul Care When the Nest is Empty, because that can be a really challenging season, whether you're an empty nest because you send a kid off to war or they get married or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, there are certain things. It's a big change in the family dynamic, and it's something that we need to sort of lean into God to get through. Wow. Thank you, Edie. And I remember that uh, like it was yesterday yesterday seeing your post and my heart sank. Um, it sank again as you shared that. Thank you for sharing that because I think it's important for our listeners to hear as you've done over and over here on the podcast, 99% of my guests, um, there was a catalyst to what became uh, their passion. You know, most of the time, we don't choose our story. It's chosen by God for us and our pain can either become something that paralyzes us, cripples us, or it can become fuel and a catalyst that the Lord can use to propel us really into our purpose. And Edie, that's really what you're describing and, and now giving us these such needed resources to navigate not only unfamiliar territory and landscapes, but the emotions that come along with it. So I'm an empty nester, but we're going to come up with a, a word that I learned today in just a second. But you've been an empty nester a number of seasons. Talk about that. You, we mentioned the two children that you, that you uh, one that went away, one on the hiking trip. Like I, I got to know a little more about it and one <laughs> to war. So 
What was this empty nest season like for you, Edie? Well, I always assumed I nothing trips me up like expectations. And my expectation as a parent was that we would have a buffer zone of college to mm. sort of get used to the empty nest. And our oldest son decided that wasn't the way he was going to do life. So he went mm. from high school graduation to Marine Corps boot camp to two tours in Iraq as a frontline infantry Marine with a bomb dog. Wow. And so it was, you know, I went from this child at home to this child being shot at halfway around the world. Wow. Now, fast forward, we all survived. It, it wasn't pretty at times, but mm -hmm. God showed up in major ways and everybody is good. But it was a struggle. But I thought since I had been through that crucible of the empty nest, the next two would be a walk in the park. I couldn't have been more wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this, the middle child is my independent child and my child who has a heart that does not want to impose on anyone. And none of my boys were interested in excelling in academics. They all graduated. They all did great in college, but high school was not their thing. Mm. So no scholarships. So my middle son decided he wanted to go to a very expensive private Christian college, but he did not want us to pay for it. Mm. So he ended up living in his truck in a parking lot close to a fast food place so he could have internet oh, and Edie. showers off of friends. Talk about feeling like a parent who's wow. failed. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> now I see it as kind of a point of pride. He turned out great. Um, and then my youngest son started in college and he was in um, outdoor leadership. And he decided that he really wanted to get his mountaineering certification worldwide so mm. that he could lead groups. So in 2019, he embarked on like a nine month trip. He, he climbed mountains in Nepal and China and all of those things. Um, but as I said, that was 2019. The company that trained him actually offered him a position. He's the only trainee they've ever offered a position to. Wow in 2019 2020 was covid yeah. they went out of business so he came home and he married the girl around the corner <laughs> <laughs> plan b which was probably yeah. god's plan a anyway right so what you're describing Edie, is such diversity that can happen with our children and you mentioned expectations we think it's going to turn out one way it doesn't <laughs> the pandemic threw a wrench and so many plans like i had a daughter that graduated right before 2020 she had an entire year of performing contracts canceled. I had another one that had to come home in the middle of his college semester and leave everything in the apartment thinking it was going to be a two week shutdown, which turned into the remainder of the semester. We had to go back and get all of his things. So no one knew how to prepare for that. And it's, it's made things really challenging. What I've seen out here, my husband and I are pastors and we've watched not only our own kids, Edie, but many others in our church and, and friends that we know you know, it, there's no one path now. It's not like you, like you said, high school to college to nine to five job. It's very diverse and it's a lot of twists and turns in this thing. Um, and so I want to mention a word that, that is, was new for me, but you identified it and you've experienced, and that's called boomerang. It's a boomerang parent yep. where the child has left and then has come back home Talk about that because that's something maybe a lot of us didn't expect, but that's the season of this empty nest ish that we're all kind of <laughs> navigating right now. Yes, absolutely. And for me, boomerang parenting, boomerang kids were really a blessing. Yeah. Because I was far from the perfect parent and far from the perfect navigator of the empty nest season. Mm -hmm. I, I, it was, it was hard for me. And so by them coming back in as adults, really, and then leaving again, I got a do-over. Yeah. It was really great. I had a chance to connect with them as adults mm. and a chance to send them off in a much more mature way. Mature for me, not them. Mm. I mean, they were already mature, but 
you know, it was it was very helpful to me to be able to get this do over. And I ended up getting it with all three kids. So oh. they didn't stay long, but they stayed as long as they needed to. You know, it's really hard to see your child as a child all your life. And then suddenly they're an adult. For me, the biggest thing was I was afraid I wouldn't be involved in their lives, mm -hmm. particularly as sons. You know, daughters tend to stay a little more connected. And I, I was really fearful of no longer being relevant. And these boomerang moments allowed me to see that I was just as relevant, but it was different yeah. in a different way. And that transition can be difficult, Edie. I mean, it's a lot of, you know, twists and turns in the bend, but, but I love that you said it's an opportunity for a do-over because, you know, it's hard on them graduating and trying to figure that out. It's hard on a parent. Um, I, it, it can be just all over the map emotionally. And I, I feel the same way. I feel like having our son come back for a couple of years, he's still here right now in this season. He travels a lot, but he's home base is here. Um, I love that. I'm, I was able to, I think sometimes we have to just live with some of the stuff that didn't get fully resolved. You know what I mean? With these teenage angst years and into college and, and we don't get that opportunity. And so I think rather than seeing it as, okay, an inconvenience, now I've got to like redo my schedule and put meals back on the table to see it as a gift. It's not always going to be that way. And so we have an opportunity to, to put up healthy boundaries as needed and to have those good conversations to make sure everyone in the home is respected, but at the same time, see it as a welcome gift that we might not have otherwise been able to have. You mentioned that you weren't the perfect mom. None of us are, <laughs> but what mistakes do you find we tend to make kind of moving into an empty nest season? For me, it was control. Mm -hmm. I have always been a control freak. I can see my family listening to this and rolling oh. on the floor laughing because oh. I just, you know, for years I thought I'm not a control freak, but I am. And it, you know, learning how to release them to God, because mm -hmm. number one, he already has them yeah. and um, come to terms with what my job as a parent really is. And it's not, my job as a parent is not to keep my kids safe. My job as a parent is to equip them to walk closely with God and let him keep them safe. Mm. That's so good, Edie. I mean, I was, I'm like and thinking as you're saying that that's going to be a wonderful clip for this podcast because <laughs> so many of us struggle with that. I mean, our whole lives from zero to 18, it's been about don't cross the street. Don't put that in your mouth. Don't, don't play with that friend. Don't do this. Don't do that. Or, you know, trying to encourage them what to do. And then all of a sudden uh, we have no control over that. And it can be very unnerving. Um, it can, it can expose, like you're saying, we didn't realize we were kind of holding on with white knuckling this thing. It's not easy being a parent. I don't care what season you're in. It just isn't easy. It's not getting easier. So number one, you need moms around you or dads. If you're a man listening of grandparent, I have friends that are grandparents raising their grandkids again, expectations. They weren't expecting at 50, 60, 70, um, to be back in the parenting season. So wherever you are in this season, Edie has four books that she's outlined all the way from the weary, which <laughs> if you're a young mom, you need it all the way through to the empty nest. So what it shows us is there's going to be unique blessings and challenges at every step of the way. Are we going to be perfect? No, but rather than beating ourselves up, we learn in God's mercy, he gives us a do over. And even if your child doesn't move back home, you can still find new ways to connect with them. Edie, we had a counselor once many years ago, my husband and I went to a, a, a wonderful ministry center for pastors out in Colorado. And, um, we were going through kind of a season in our own parents where we were trying to segue out <laughs> of like them be the authority. Um, and, and it was, we were just having some normal challenges in that season. And um, this counselor said, Angela, when you're, when you're younger, when your kids are at home, you're their authority. But when they move out and transition, even into the upper teenage years, you're moving from authority to influence. 
And if you don't navigate that well, like you're saying with control, then you don't have either. You don't have authority and you don't have influence. So that has helped me now with my own children to feel like, okay, I don't have control over all of their choices. I don't have control over everything that they're doing. Like you said, they're the Lord's anyway. They belong to God. He's entrusted into us for a season and we're still in their lives. But in order to have a role of influence, we have to really release them to the Lord. And that is just not, that is not an easy practice. And it's not um, for the faint of heart to do. I want to ask you about some of the emotions that we navigate, Edie. So everything from a mom who feels like, what is my purpose now that my kids are grown out of the home? Maybe they're crying. Maybe they're just kind of feeling a little lost and disoriented. That's maybe one end of the spectrum. The other end is they're like throwing confetti. You know what I mean? <laughs> and maybe they feel guilty that they're celebrating. So help us navigate maybe these two ends of the spectrum. And and what is your your guidance for us walking through these emotions? Well, I think the the main thing is is prayer and moving close to God. Um, you know, because he knows all of the emotions and strong emotions are not bad emotions right. and they have to have some place to go. So we need an outlet for them, whether it's uh, a physical friend that we can talk to or whether it's journaling or whether it's getting out and hiking in the, in the soul care books, the creative exercises range from the full scope, from everything from drawing to journaling to even cooking, because everybody's creativity comes out in a different way. But I think the biggest thing is learning how to pray for our kids and hold on tight to God, and at the same time, release them into his care. Mm. And so it's, you know, it it's hard to do both, but it is possible because he will do the work in us that has to do that. And I think it's not beating ourselves up because we're not like this friend or that TV sitcom or whatever. And the idea that we only have one emotion is just not reasonable. Well, you're going to have all of them. That's true. And they can sneak up on you. I remember <laughs> dropping our daughter off at college, you know, and it was, we trained, we changed universities, but the first year she was a long ways away from us, like an eight hour drive. And then I left for an overseas ministry and missions trip like a week later. And I maybe because of all the logistics of getting her dropped off and then my own schedule getting ready for, for the trip, it's like it hit me. Like I can feel myself getting emotional talking about it. It hit me on the plane. And I'm sitting in this plane and all of a sudden I just could not stop crying, Edie. It was just like this overwhelming sense of loss. I remember going to the airport and seeing a mom walking with a little girl and thinking, you know, like that season's done. So I think we have to be kind to ourselves because still, even now my daughter's 27, I can still get emotional about it, thinking that we don't get to go back. We don't, you know, we honor every season we're in. Our kids are in our lives now in a different season. Um, but it can be tricky when all of a sudden you see something or you witness something or you don't have something um, that you thought, you know, my kids are not married yet. Some of my friends or kids are already married. I don't, I don't have grandkids. My kids jokingly say I'm never going to have grandkids. So <laughs> I have to like process some of that. So I love that you said we can't compare ourselves or our own experiences walking through this to anybody else because they're going to be unique. And even each child is going to be unique. It's not going to be the same experience for every single child. Any other thoughts you would, you would add to that Edie? Well, I think the biggest thing is to give yourself grace and to give other people grace mm. and to, like I keep saying, stay anchored to God. Also learn how to ask your kids questions instead of making statements. You know, sometimes when I make a statement, it comes across that I'm telling them something. Whereas if I'm asking them, it's easier for them to let me into their world. And so I think 
that um, we need to learn how to do that. And I think we need to stop waiting to be ambushed by problems and begin expecting the blessings that God has in this season. Mm, that is so good. That is gold right there. That was worth eh, listening. That that's that's what I need to go back and replay because I I I stumbled into that awareness and had someone told me three years ago, Edie. I needed this conversation three years ago. <laughs> like stop, like back to that when they're younger, we tell them, right? You know, we, we give them, Hey, you need to do your homework or, or don't do this or do this. And, and the difference in, I might know in my gut, like, that's not a good decision. And everything <laughs> within you wants to be like telling them reframe it. Well, what do you think? Well, how, I don't know. What is your gut telling you? What have you prayed about it? What, uh, what are your options? Number one, it, it allows them to feel respected and honored because they want to feel like they're, they're finding their way and they're doing a good job. At least that's been my experience. And the more I tell and not ask it, it puts a little bit of a wedge up in the communication when I'm in, when I'm asking open-ended questions or I'm allowing them to kind of just share with me, not immediately offering my opinion, that has made a huge, huge difference, Edie. So yes, I a hundred percent agree with that statement. And I wish I, I wish I had um, realized it a little sooner, but again, we don't go back. We move forward. We make adjustments and, uh, and it's okay to say, Hey, you know what? I don't know that I, I did that as well as I would have loved to. I was navigating a lot of emotions. Forgive me for times if it was this or that, and I'd love to move forward with this. And those words are very powerful and restorative and healing as well. So wherever you are in your parenting, we want you to feel encouraged today um, that every moment that you're spending with your children matters, whether they're a, a thousand miles away or still under your roof. And uh, Edie's going to pray over us in just a moment. But Edie, I want to ask two last questions and you may have touched on it, but what you're, you're such an advocate for soul care as I am as well, you know, as a performance oriented person, what I call myself a recovering perfectionist, and it's been <laughs> a, a long, a lifelong process with the Lord, you know, that has not been easy for me. I'm, I'm product, I'm productivity driven. So having to see soul care and rest and Sabbath as equally productive in our lives was a mindset shift and a soul shift. So maybe it's the creativity, but how would you best encourage us? Maybe just how do you practice soul care in a way that that you would encourage those today where they're struggling in this department? Well, I think the thing of it is, is, is we often set goals or expectations that are unreachable. Like I'm going to have a quiet time for an hour every day this week, or right. I'm going to practice soul care, this, this, and this. And instead it's more of, like you say, it's a shift. Mm -hmm. uh, looking at, instead of looking at your phone and playing a game, maybe what you ought to do is read a verse of scripture or pull out a sketch pad or take a walk outside and look up and realize we're in this amazing creation that God gave us. Just taking those short times to refocus on God instead of trying to just get away from what's going on and lose our minds in electronics or in something like that. If we can shift it to taking care of our souls, that that is a huge thing. Soul care is very different, as you know, from self care. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about spa days here. Yeah, you know, I'm really talking about connecting more strongly with God, so that we can have that conduit of peace that He promises us. That's so good, Edie. And it takes for me, and I'm sure for so many of our listeners, it takes being quiet, coming away from that distraction, because. We do have to be aware of what our own heart is feeling. And sometimes we don't know that until we, like you said, sketch it out or write it down or talk it out with the Lord. Um, and that can be a little scary, especially if you've been kind of numb in some areas to think, man, I'm really struggling with this. But 
the, the beauty is we don't have to wait until we've got it together to come to the Lord. He wants us to come to him right in the middle of it. For me, sitting outside in the morning, starting my day outside, you know, with my cup of coffee and you said, like you said, exhaling in nature, centering my heart, my mind on Christ. And then I need little hooks throughout the day to revisit that because you know, things can steal our peace in a moment. And so protecting your peace, strengthening your soul, it's so crucial. And Edie's giving us practical ways that don't have to feel overwhelming. They just can feel, become a natural part of the rhythm of your life. So Edie, before you pray for us, tell us how people can connect with you and not only get your new soul care book, but all of these resources that you offer. And then answer one last question for me. And that is other than Jesus, who is that person in the Bible that most inspires you to continue making your life matter for the kingdom? I think the one at the moment beyond Jesus who most inspires me has got to be Deborah mm -hmm. uh, from Judges 4. I mean, she was a wife. She was a mother. She was a prophet. She was a judge. She was a leader. Yeah. And I think for so long in Christian circles, in some of them, not all of them, but in some of them, women have basically been told to sit down and shut up. Yeah. And the fact is that's not biblical. And so when I began exploring what the Bible actually said, I found some really amazing role models and it helped me to find the path that God had for me and not be timid about following what he was telling me. So mm. she's one that I would really love to sit down and find out how she did it all. You and me both. I think her line is going to be very long of people <laughs> who want to have that conversation. And I'm so glad you said that because I'm such an advocate for women stepping fully into the call of God in their life, whatever that means and whatever season that is. And uh, when you when you really study both Old Testament and New Testament, you see the heart of God, we need, we need all hands on deck, you know, men and women taking their posts. And I just returned from Greece earlier this year and was able to walk in the footsteps of Priscilla, who's one of my mm -hmm. heroes of the new Testament, who, you know, carried that gospel right alongside of Paul and her husband. So, um, you know, we want to encourage you just wherever you are and whatever season, and if it's mom of three kids, that's your, that's your ministry at home right now. And maybe you're working as well. I mean, there's a lot on our plate as women, but whatever he's calling you to, to do, do it fully unto him and know that he's, he's for you. And, uh, he wants what's best for you as well. And Edie, tell us how to connect with you. I really want people to get a, a copy of this, especially anyone who just started school. Maybe your kids are in college and, and you're realizing, wow, I've got to go through this book. I really need this resource in my life right now. Well, you can always connect with me through my website, edmelson.com. All of my books that are still in print are on Amazon. My publisher is Bold Division Books. Um, on my website, I actually have a downloadable that's free, and it's called... Uh, first aid it's a first aid kit for weary creatives and so oh, you can my. actually download uh, a devotion a prayer a coloring page and a list of things that you could put together in a basket and oh. take to someone who is caregiving or a new mom or a mother who has just sent somebody off to college or maybe they were fine with going off to college but they've had fall break and they're leaving again and that's when it's hitting. So this soul care for weary creatives is my free gift to everybody. And you can find it on the front page of my website. Oh, Edie, I love that so much. And get a copy of her brand new book, as well as some of the others. And maybe, you, maybe you're not in an empty nest season, but you know someone who is. And just because everything may look fine, like we're saying, these emotions are sneaky. And uh, we have, we need, we all need each other. And we need ultimately to depend on the Lord to navigate, um, as Edie's expressed here, a myriad of seasons in life, which could have easily, Edie, uh, sidelined you. And, and no one would have, uh, everyone would have understood. But you've been determined and resilient, and you've continued, as my counselor back then said, to push your pain into the heart of Jesus. He's the one that can really take it. And then we're not left 
with that soul weariness because we're trying to carry something we were never intended to carry. So thank you, Edie, for all you do, not only to serve creatives and communicators, but just people in general. And uh, thank you for this new resource. I'm going to get it myself <laughs> and go through it and uh, and continue to navigate this season of young adults and all that God has for us. We want to live fully in uh, the full presence and grace of the Lord in our lives and um, to make our lives matter in whatever season that we are. So thank you, Edie, for being here. And I would love for you to pray over our listeners as we close. I would love to. Most gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the seasons that you give us, Lord. Um, it's hard to thank you in the hard times. And yet, as we come out of them, we realize what precious times those difficulties have been and have uh, given us with you, Lord. And so for everyone listening to this, I pray, Father, that you would show up in a way that they cannot miss you. I pray for peace where there is fear. I pray for release where there are control issues like with me, Lord. And most of all, I pray for our kids who are going out into this world. I pray that we would be able to see glimpses of what you are doing in their lives and we would be able to see tangible proof of how you are protecting them and using them and growing them into the image of what you have planned for them. Give us hope, fill us with joy, even in difficult times. And most of all, help us to lean into you no matter where our path takes us. In Christ's name I pray, amen.